Hello, everybody. We will be starting very shortly. As you come in, please feel free to put the organization you work for and your name in the chat. We'd love to know who's here. Also, if you've been in here before, you know we'll have an unplug session starting at noon, going for 30 minutes. And so as questions come up in your mind, please feel free to throw those into the chat or feel free to just keep them and take yourself off chat, uh, off mute, turn on your camera during the unplug session and ask the question yourself. That's the best way to go. Also, let us know how uh, how the weather is where you're at. Did you get snow? Are you snowed in? Sean, are you? How are you all doing up there? Duluth is getting hit hard, but the range is only supposed to get between one to three inches, and it's the same thing with the last big storm we had. That you know Duluth got nailed, but you know Shale has probably had to dig herself out, but uh, we didn't get it so bad here. Interesting. Someone said we don't get many opportunities to say the farther north you are, the better weather you have. This winter seems to have that. I feel like I should use that for a plug. Like the farther north you go, the better the weather is. Just saying. 21 days till spring. Um, I don't know if anybody here is from the Moorhead area or is familiar with Moorhead, uh, home of the Dilly Bar. We have an outdoor Dairy Queen that uh, opens today. It's closed between November and March 1st, and so today it opens. Yep. Come on down, Shayla. Don't don't tip me with a dilly bar. <laughs> Jessica O'Brien, how is your weather? Our weather's pretty good. Yeah, it's looking good today. Yeah, snow? we had a little bit of sun this morning, which I always appreciate. A little slice of sunlight, trying to get that vitamin D for five minutes. It's always a pleasure in the middle of winter. The tail end of winter. You didn't get any snow down there? I a little bit overnight. Uh, yeah. It's taller than my dogs here. Okay, Jessica. All right, it looks like we're ready to go. And so if we want to uh, move to the next slide here, I want to welcome everyone. Uh, good morning, and thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Jessica O'Brien, and I'm a workforce strategy consultant in uh, southeast Minnesota. And on behalf of our team, I want to welcome you all to our Workforce Wednesday session on preparing for the new workforce. Um, as was mentioned earlier, we always like to know uh, where people are joining us from. So we do want to invite you to put your um, name, your organization or your company and the city that you are joining us from today in the chat. And as a reminder um, to everybody, our Workforce Wednesday webinars are held on a monthly basis on the first Wednesday of every month from 11 a.m. to noon uh, with a special unplugged Q&A session afterwards uh, with all of our panelists from uh, 12 to 1230. And a couple of other quick notes to share. So today's webinar will be recorded and posted on our Workforce Wednesday Career Force uh, webpage 
along with the slide deck and all of the resources and links uh, that will be shared today. And so as you can see on this slide, our team has created a calendar of all of our future webinar opportunities as well. And so we'll go to the next slide. And our workforce strategy consultant team works regionally across the state to develop innovative workforce solutions by aligning resources, facilitating collaboration, and leveraging expertise in targeted industry sectors to drive economic equity and growth within Minnesota. And so to reach any of us on our team, uh, we will provide a link to our regional map and also uh, that will have all of our contact information as well. And so with that, I'm gonna go ahead and hand things over to my colleague who works in the Northwest Minnesota region, James Whirlwind Soldier. Over to you. Thanks, Jessica. This is a, uh, it's great to see you this morning. It's great to see everybody this morning um, on this snowy day. Uh, as I hope everybody knows, today we're gonna talk about uh, a specific demographic shift we're seeing not only in Minnesota, but across the United States. Uh, we're seeing it in different regions. We're seeing it in different areas of the country. What we're specifically talking about here is the mass retirement of baby boomers, basically leaving our workforce, um, and Generation Z becoming that more prominent or dominant work uh, workforce demographic. Um, to start out today, let's go ahead and go over the agenda quickly so we know where we're at here. Um, first thing we're going to do is look over some data so we have a better idea of, of who this Gen Z workforce is and what we can expect. Um, after that, we'll make introductions to our, our uh, panelists so we can continue this conversation. Um, I personally really want to understand uh, who this Generation Z workforce is, what they value and prioritize, and why I should be excited about them becoming this dominant generation in our workforce. Um, as mentioned, as your questions come up, please add them to the chat, or again, be prepared to take yourself off mute and turn your camera on during that unplugged session. So who are we talking about when we're talking about Gen Z? Specifically, we're talking about people who are between the ages of 11 and 26 this year. Uh, different websites are going to have different age brackets, but typically we're talking about people who were born between 1997 and 2012. These were kids during the Great Recession. So these were people that experienced their parents' response to that Great Recession, how, they, how it changed their behaviors, uh, and they had to kind of live through that. Generation Z, uh, they're natural multitaskers, right? These are individuals that have learned very early to use multiple screens. Um, one fact about Generation Z is they're really capable of jumping from work-related tasks to non-work-related tasks and back and forth. They have a natural skill at that, and also they are early adopters. I think another statistic I read was that Generation Z received their first phone or tablet at the age of 12 on average. By the way, I forgot to mention this. I'm going to make sure that uh, the, the sources of this information that we're talking about is placed in our chat. Otherwise, I'll make sure and give you those sources uh, at the end of today. Uh, in addition, this generation has grown up social, right? Uh, us Gen Xers, I'm a, I'm a solid Gen Xer. We weren't raised uh, with social media, right? But one thing we know about social media is we have to actively or proactively put ourselves out there, right? We have to de define who we are. We have to de def define our identity and what we like and dislike uh, to interact with social media. And this is something that Generation Z has been, this, this paradigm is something they have lived in uh, since childhood. Um, and part of this identity uh, is also an ethical identity. And this seems to go across the board with regard to all of Gen Z. Uh, in fact, some statistics show that 47% of Gen Zers believe brands should speak out against injustice. And 45% of Gen Zers stop purchasing products from brands because of ethical concerns. So what does that tell me as someone who works in workforce? If this generation is willing to change their behavior at this age, then you know in a climate where there's two and a half jobs for every job seeker, they're willing to change their job for one that aligns more with their priorities. We also have to remember Gen Zers, right? We're talking about kids age, I shouldn't say kids, uh, people age between 11 and 26, excuse me for that, right? These are people in a lot of search, uh, situations that don't have jobs and they don't have cash flow like they will 10 or 15 years from now. And so just imagine uh, what that kind of priority is going to do to our marketing and, and to our sales and so forth. So what else do we know about Gen Z here? Um, we know that they're going to be the most populous generation in history. Um, 
33.3% of the Earth's population by 2025. They're also the most diverse in history. Across the United States, 48% of Generation Zers identify as non-white. These numbers are different for Minnesota, so I'll show you those, right? Uh, when you're talking about the United States, you're talking about the South and a lot of areas that are quite, uh, quite diverse compared to Minnesota. So our numbers are different, but we're going to show those just to make sure that we understand that. Uh, and that's going to be the richest uh, as a whole generation in history. By 2030, this generation is going to have over $3.1 trillion in spending power. So again, this isn't just about us, our organizations, uh, understanding what the values and priorities are uh, of Gen Z so that we can be effective recruiters and retainers. It's also about sales. It's also about marketing and that sort of thing. Let's break this down a little bit closer for Minnesota. Um, as you can see by this graph, Minnesota's aged population that's 55 to 64 is projected to decline by nearly 156,000 by 2033. This is due to the baby boomers aging out of this group, right? So the youngest boomers are gonna be 69 in 2033, so they fall out of this bracket. That's a lot of experienced workers that are reaching to that traditional retirement age. Um, and Generation X, the smallest generation, is not large enough to displace the loss of, gener uh, of the boomers. So as you see, the 55 to 64, that's when X, uh, Xers are starting to enter into that age bracket, and we're still at 155,000 loss. Right, that's with Gen Xers, or just there's not enough of us. And so, if you look at this graph, really, the millennials are a much larger group, but they're still not large enough to replace the boomer workforce. Generation Z is the key, uh, the key group that increases Minnesota's total working age population. We're talking ages 15 to 64 by over 40,000. So, it's important that they're here. What else do we know about? Uh, Minnesota's Gen Z population. Well, let's look at these graphs right here. So the graph on the left is from the Minnesota State Demographic Center, and this shows an increase in people who identify as something other than non-Hispanic white across our state. Um, virtually all the net population growth in the coming decades will be from populations of color. As you can see, this goes all the way up to 2053. This is going to continue, right? And we're going to see these numbers, uh, larger numbers throughout the United States, but uh, Regardless, you'll see us uh, still reaching that number. The graph on the right shows the ethnic changes projected for the whole United States as provided by the US Census. As you can see, they, they project those who identify as non-Hispanic white are gonna shrink by al almost 19 million people by 2060. Again, this is just how demographics and these sorts of things work. Um, as an FYI, this is just a little interesting fact. Uh, William Fry, uh, he's a, dem a demographer for Brookings Institute. Uh, he says those that identify as non-white are gonna fall below the 50% range right, right around 2045. So that's a big thing if you think about it. Then the last graph I want to show here um, is uh, Minnesota age or diversity in age by, excuse me, diversity by age in Minnesota. This uh, data was provided to me by Anthony Schaffhauser. I'm going to make sure that uh, his email address is in the chat uh, and also with the, the assets we send out at the end of this presentation. Uh, he's a great person if you have any questions regarding this or want to take a deeper dive, but he's uh, bracketed off here, the three age brackets that make up Gen Z. So you can see just the, the how much more diverse that group is. And on the right, we did a little bit of mathematics. So you can see just the differences there, right? So we have the bracketed off sections, that's uh, people age five to 24, 30% uh, identify as, as non-white. The other bracket, 25 to 64, 19.2% identify as non-white. Um, that's quite a jump, right? And it's especially interesting when you think that 5 to 24 is a much smaller range than 25 to 64. So again, when we're looking at Gen Z, what we're seeing here is we're seeing um, a, a demographic that is increasingly identifying as, as non-white. So what does that mean? So now that we kind of understand this, also just so you know, uh, this conversation will continue um, next month with Jessica O'Brien, who's kind of... Uh, taking this conversation to the next step on a more tactical level, and she'll deep dive into some of these uh, statistics in a, in a more, uh, probably more eloquent way than I was doing. Uh, so let's go ahead and take a, uh, 
moment here and introduce our speakers, our panelists, and let's give them a couple of moments to just uh, speak about what they're doing and maybe why this is such a priority for them. So first I'd like to introduce Nancy Lyons. Nancy is a CEO, author, and a speaker. Uh, Nancy has been in the forefront of work culture, uh, this conversation for more than 20 years. Uh, People first as a business strategy is her guiding principle that fuels her unique and award-winning culture at her organization, Clockwork. Uh, Nancy has won multiple awards, including uh, uh, she's a National Association of Women Business Owners for the Minnesota Hall of Fame. Um, she's an inductee for that. She was awarded the most admired CEO from the Minneapolis St. Paul Business Journal. Um, and she was featured on NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt in a segment titled The Best Place to Work in America. Folks, when I was trying to figure out what I would say about Nancy, it was really difficult to get that number down. There's many, many bullet points, many, many awards that she's won. Nancy, I hope you're okay with the ones I picked. Um, but again, there's way too many for us to go over today. It's just a real honor to have you here. So thank you. Uh, next in our panel, I want to uh, introduce us to Sean Herhusky. Sean, you're kind of like a mentor to me and a lot of other workforce strategy consultants. And so it's an honor to have you here. Um, Sean is the manager of workforce strategy and talent pipeline for Essentia. Before Essentia, uh, Sh Sean worked as a workforce strategy consultant with Deed. He was one of us. Um, he's earned his graduate degrees from the College of Saints Scholastica, excuse me, in both management uh, with a focus on organizational development and business administration. Sean is the current president of the Arrowhead Regional Consortium on Healthcare Staffing, or ARCS. He also serves on a variety of different community organizations, including the Duluth Workforce Development Board and Revive Virginia. Again, Sean, you're one of those guys that you hear a lot about behind the scenes because of you made a big impact on, on our team and on Deed. And just again, really honored to have you back here again. Um, I know you're really busy and doing a lot of good work. So thank you so much. Next on our panel it, uh, are, is Anna Peterson. So Anna, Again, it's an honor to have you here as the head of people and culture at Deed. Uh, Anna is responsible for driving the growth and development of Deed's most important asset to the agency, its, its people. And prior to joining Deed, Anna worked for nearly a decade for the City of Minneapolis's Step Up Youth Employment Program, a national model for youth workforce development where she was the director for four years. Anna, you're one of these amazing people that's able to bridge the, 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 the gap between theory and practice. And it's really great to have you here because you can talk you can talk theory right and fascinate us all day but really you you see the good work happening you see the needle moving by the application of this this sort of work at Dean. and so thank you for the good work you do for for the organization that i work for but also thanks for being part of this panel because um, i think you have a lot to share and last but not least is miss chocoletta simpson chocoletta is the director of the office of Institutional Equity and Access and the Chief Diversity Office uh, Officer at St. Cloud State University. Her pronouns are she and her. Ms. Simpson oversees and monitors hiring searches and leads efforts to promote diversity and eliminate discrimination. She reports to the president and serves on the president's cabinet. She advises the president on issues related to diversity, equity, and inclusion, while also serving as a resource to members of the campus uh, community and implementing DEI strategies and programs. Ms. Simpsons has worked uh, in higher education for over seven years at multiple institutions throughout the Midwest. Um, Chocoletta, you came highly recommended by Della, and after our first conversation, we kind of realized that we had probably hours of conversation to go there, and the depth of understanding that you have with this DEI, whether that's talking about it from an institutional level, education level, or even up to like legislation, um, I think you're going to be a real positive addition to this panel, and I really thank you for being here. So without further ado, I think the next thing we need to do is just get started with our conversation. So again, please, everybody, uh, as we speak, um, as we have a conversation here, if any questions uh, come up for you, please feel free to throw those into the chat or just keep them close to yourself uh, and take yourself off chat, turn on your camera during the unplug session. So thanks so much for being here, everybody. Um, let's go and just dive in. Like I mentioned earlier, uh, Jessica uh, O'Brien is going to continue this conversation on a more tactical level next month. Um, and so what we're talking about today is probably more of a strategic side of things, maybe more of that theoretical side of things as opposed to the practical side of things. But it's going to give us a good uh, opportunity to create a shared vocabulary and have a dialogue so that when we continue that conversation next week, 
on a more uh, granular basis, um, we'll have that kind of that, that groundwork to build off of. So, um, Nancy, when we first spoke, uh, you had a very interesting point of view kind of on on where we're at today and kind of the history of, of how we got here with regard to our generations. And if I remember right, you called it Internet thinking. Could you just take a few moments and uh, tell us what Internet thinking actually is? Sure. Uh, you know, Internet thinking was a phrase that um, my business partner and I coined for a talk we did in, I think it was 1998. I was seven years old. And um, we, uh, we, we really were starting to recognize that the internet would be a catalyst for an enormous amount of change when it came to work and culture and what people expected from workplaces. Um, and so we tried to get people to subscribe to being part of this movement that was starting around um, you know, freedom, flexibility, the internet was empowering, it gave access to information, it also opened up opportunity. Suddenly, not only could we match our values with other organizations because they were stating their values really clearly, but we could also talk to people that actually work inside of those organizations and we could do it from the comfort of our basements in our pajama pants, right? So um, I, I think it's interesting that we, we are having these conversations now as if they are new um, or as if the pandemic suddenly shifted things for us or as if it's, um, you know, and with all due respect to this content, I think, you know, what can we all agree on about the younger generation? Well, we aren't thrilled with them because they are pushing for all of this change that nobody likes. But the truth is we do like it. It is empowering for all of us. Everybody wants the same things. Um, we want to be seen, we want to be heard, we want to be valued, we want to work in a purposeful way. And um, and all of this came about because of the internet, the difference between Gen Xers like you and I, James, and the Zs or millennials that we're talking about is we thought it wasn't an option. We just continued to, even as we were, we were not conforming anymore, um, we trying to bust out of those molds, we still thought we had to work our way up to an ideal position. And now because Gen Xers and boomers raised the next generation to believe that they are worthy and purposeful and valuable human beings, they're asking for things we never had the courage to ask for before. So internet thinking really was just us coining a phrase that was um, that encapsulated the catalyst that was the internet for work. You, uh, so yeah, you you mentioned in the conversation we had originally that a lot of this came out of Gen Xers. I, I don't know if this were, these were your words, but just having a greater sense of who they were and a greater sense of like valuing authenticity. Yeah, I, you know, I think um, when you look back on the media, you know, in those defining moments for Generation X, you see, um, you know, a real desire to break out of traditional molds and hierarchical, you know, thinking, that need for permission. You see a desire to stop conforming. And because boomers, you know, dominated the workforce at that time, we got labeled as slackers and lazy. Right. When what we were yeah. trying to do was push for change. But what do people really resist? Change. Um, so I do think as much as I admire, um, you know, the 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 way that um, younger generations value themselves and their time. I also think we wouldn't be in this place if not for the Internet and Gen X really starting to pave that ground. Um, so I do think that we made inroads, whether or not we get any credit for it, the invisible generation, whatever, I'm fine. Exactly. We're awesome, Nancy. Um, you mentioned uh, matching values with organizations and, and so forth, and I wanted to maybe jump this conversation over, bring it over to Sean. Um, how have you seen, because we've talked about this before, so I feel good asking you this question. How have you seen the evolution over time of organizational values? Um, and how do uh, how are you seeing organizations utilize values in a way that's different than, say, when I was just entering the workforce in the 90s? Yeah, 
So organizational values have always kind of been defined as the core beliefs that are held by an organization. The, the things that are on the signs, you know, they're the artifacts that are up all over the place showing, you know, what we believe in. This is what we say. We're customer first. We're employee centric. We're whatever. And um, you can really kind of break that down into two levels. There's the espoused values, which is basically what they say they do, the value that they say they're offering, what they say they believe in. And then there's the theory and use, um, if you're a Chris Argyris fan, or the enacted values, which is what they're actually doing. And I think what's kind of changed and evolved over time is before, if a company wasn't living the values that they indicated, there was, you know, some disharmony in the organization. But especially if, you know, the unemployment rate was really high or we're in the middle of the Great Recession or something, there was... The, the people tolerated it. They maybe didn't like it, but they still tolerate it. Now, though, with some of the criteria that you talked about earlier, James, in your uh, introduction, there is a whole new level of mobility in the workforce. And your work is not necessarily tied to that particular job anymore. So if you go to a company and they say, we are all about the customer and we believe in or this is one of our core organizational values, and you go there and they're not, you don't have to stay there. You can hop over to an organization that matches the values that they're espousing, which is kind of what you were talking about earlier, James. There's just much more mobility and fluidity in the market where you're not stuck in one place. If you go there and the organizational values that you are kind of sold on are not adequately represented, you can hop somewhere else that is more in line with your value set. Yeah. Um. Do you think organizations are recognizing that as a tool? I think so, as there's more emphasis on things like the employer value proposition, employer brand, um, you know, some of the other things that are, are, as hiring becomes more and more difficult, they're realizing that retention is a key element in order to kind of survive this, because you can't really grow your way out of this situation. There's no one to take in. So you've really got to understand you know, why people are leaving your organization. And one of the key reasons people leave an organization is the mismatch between the espoused values and the actual values that are being demonstrated. Yeah. What you mentioned an uh, employee value proposition. What, sure. what do you mean by that? And then, well, technically to, to give the, the Wikipedia explanation, <laughs> It's the unique set of benefits that an employer receives in return for the skills, capabilities, and experience they bring to a company. I usually say it's it's your elevator pitch to an employee. It's your 15 seconds, why would you ever work for me? And so the reason that's important is because there's so much, there's so many people, I guess, hiring right now, and there's so much opportunity to even like, non-linear career pathways, you know, completely switching industries, completely switching, uh, you know, segments that you have to be able to articulate on a moment's notice, just like an elevator pitch, why you should come work for me. And I, it's one of those things that I should have prepared and ready to go so that if somebody asks, why would I go to your hospital? Why would I not work at this hospital? You've got to be able to articulate that quickly. And you've got to be able to articulate it in a meaningful way that that means something to them. So yeah. To tie it back to the organizational values, if you say, but we believe in justice, we believe in fairness, we believe in equity for the entire population, you know, these things that we stand for, these are things that, you know, Gen Z's would gravitate towards. Mm -hmm. So we've got to be able to articulate that effectively and quickly. Yeah, it's super interesting and different from when I was, like, again, when I was entering the workforce or considering my career or building my career at the beginning, right? Like, it, it was such a different market for work that or, uh, employers didn't need to fish so hard for for talent. It seemed like you know there was so many there's so many opportunities out there that you were doing the person the favor by giving them a job in the in the first place, and that seems to have turned around completely. And it, you know the organizations I work with they're doing everything they can to keep people, and they do understand that idea of employer value proposition. And I just want to make maybe throw it out to the entire panel. Um, have you seen any interesting innovations with regard to that employer value proposition? Uh, ways that organizations are 
bringing people in that's putting them uh you know setting them aside or, or elevating them uh from the competition unexpected question um, but maybe while we're thinking about that, that's an interesting question. I'm going to pivot it over to to Anna. That works for me. So Anna, you brought up something very interesting before that I, I thought was just a great idea or topic, um, and it relates to what Jessica is going to talk about next month. And what you talked about was building a, a culture of responsibility through OKRs, which when you first started talking about that, I, all I heard was the accountability word and it got me scared. And I was like, I don't want anything to do with that. But as you continue to like discuss what you were, what that meant, that culture of accountability through OKRs, it was something that I think, again, just like Nancy mentions, everybody wants it, right? And I think the way, I'll, I'm going to allow you to describe it better, but I think what you were basically saying was that we're talking about organizational culture that's more uh, outcome-oriented versus process-oriented. Um, first off, am I correct with that? And number two, could you uh, kind of uh, build on, on that idea? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for uh, thanks for asking. So OKRs is objectives and key results, and it's something that a lot of private sector companies use to uh, measure if they're doing what they say they're going to do and getting the outcomes that they want. And that's something that um, when Commissioner Grove started at DEED, he brought to DEED, and I uh, led that charge for uh, the first few years. Um, um, and, and I've been at DEED for four years, so it's been about four years since we adopted the OKR system. The first thing we had to do is teach people the system, right? So we taught people the system. We taught people how to measure it. And, and I think the most important part for Deed was um, the the drumbeat of continuing, right? Every quarter we would score them. And every quarter we, at the town hall meetings, we would say, here's where we're at. And honestly, that first year that we did it, we had uh, key results that we didn't have the data to measure we were, you know, we we were learning as we go. We're like, oh, okay, we don't really have a score for this because we can't figure out how to measure it, or that there's a delay in the data, or, you know, and we learn together how to do it. Now that it's been four years, we're doing that really well. And I think what that does for the people of Deed is, um, you you have this renewed focus on the mission and the goals for that year, right? And um, and unique to state government and to deed specifically is like we have this amazing mission to empower the growth of the Minnesota economy for everyone, right? So that's really attractive for the um, Gen Z population when they are looking for that mission-driven work. But but what 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 happens in state government is lawmakers, uh, you know, make incredible laws for the people, and then they get put at different agencies, and they don't always put the people to stand up those programs. So when we have OKRs, you start to see what you should stop doing. Not stop doing legislatively. We are a compliance agency. We will always be compliant. We always go by the law. But it starts to put a, a clearer focus on like, this is my work, right? And in that, you start to get this collective excitement about the work in a different kind of way. And I think that that's why it's important culturally to have that kind of focused system. And I, we use OKRs, but there's many different models that we can use as well. Um, so, so and, and then I have kind of an answer when I was listening to Sean talking about that values mismatch. I had a thought about that when he was talking. So, so you join a company, you love what their values are, you're so excited about the mission, and then you get there and you're like, oh, we're not really focusing on the customer. And is and well, as you're learning your job about what to do. And I think that uh, one thing we say at Deed is like, good ideas come from everyone, come from everywhere. It's not just leaders that have great ideas. So I would ask you at your companies, where do people go with their great ideas? Because if you, if you have the values mismatch and you're that employee who's like, this is kind of a bummer, it's not what I signed up for, but I have a good idea on how we could make that match better. Where do I go with that idea? And something we've done at Deed is we launched an innovation lab where we can go and we can workshop those ideas with a human-centered design approach and talk to our customers and, and try to change the way we do the work. And I think, uh, I think that empowers people to stay too because they can say, I don't like this and I have the power to somehow go figure out how to change it. And, and we've had some great uh, success in that as well. 
Am I wrong when I say this is a, or taking this in a maybe a, not really a different direction, but maybe an unexpected turn because something just came to my mind? If I remember hearing correctly, Deed has a way of communicating feedback anonymously. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. So one of the big ways when I joined Deed, uh, there was just a, I would say an atrophy of culture. It just wasn't a thing that we really talked about. Some teams talked about it. Some divisions within Deed did a great job with it. It wasn't something that we like focused on supporting our people or really like bringing everybody together toward our, toward our goals. And so we have our uh, employee survey that we do every year, and that becomes the blueprint for what we do. Mm -hmm. It's what the people say they want and need. And then we have an employee committee that really looks at those results and builds on like the actions that we're going to take. Another thing is like doing it, right? Not just saying that we're going to do it. We don't do an employee survey and stick it in a drawer. We have almost 80% response rate on these surveys. And the reason why is because people were totally transparent about what you said you needed and wanted, what the committee thinks we should do, and then what we're doing and where we fell down, right? Like, oh, we thought we would do this by this date. We didn't do it yet, but we're plan, you know, the plans. So, um, so, and that survey is anonymous. And then we also just have multiple other ways that we uh, look to get anonymous feedback because it, it, in my role, if I don't know about the issue, I can't help. I've worked for organizations in the past. And again, I mean, panelists, please chime in anytime. Uh, I've worked with organizations in the past who have really been against allowing communication methods that are anonymous or confidential. And what would you what would you say to a, an employer, an executive who feels that that's a bad idea? Go back to um, me. Oh, go ahead. Everybody. Talk a lot, please. Oh, well, I think it's just a really good question. And Anna hit on um, what I know as the term is psychological safety in the workplace and that ability to share my experiences, share my thoughts and ideas and it be supported. I think the um, the truth is that all of us do not feel like we have psychological safety. And so therefore having an ability to share your thoughts and concerns and not be identified um, is a good idea, um, especially if more of the concern is to kind of hear and listen to what the feedback is and concerns are so that as an organization you can address them um, without pointing folks out. I think that is always a, a good method um, and honestly just um, just thinking about the different um, as we talk about demographics right most of our you know newer generation they're not really that some of them are pretty vocal but I know some especially working on a college campus that Sometimes that anonymous or screen protection is what I call it, gives them that added um, measure of courage. And so I think it it's certainly a good idea and something that should be considered when you're trying to gain feedback to make change. Chocolate, have you, could you talk for a second just about the how the college experience has changed from let's say even like 10 years ago and 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 maybe ask you know are, are those are those changes made to accommodate a new generation, or were they was it more of like of a nat a natural kind of evolution? No, that's a good good question. Thank you, James, for that. So I've had the pleasure of, of working in higher education pretty much my whole career, a little over seven years now, mm -hmm. um, and I would say that the culture. Um, has significantly changed, especially as we talk about the changing age demographics, but also the change in race, gender, sexual orientation, and and again the the laws and and the different um, what I call external sources that play into that um, mm -hmm. also have an impact. But I also think um, because of those trends, we have an opportunity, especially as higher education, to ensure that we're paying attention to those trends, changing things, accommodating things, re reviewing things. Um, I also think that the pandemic has significantly impacted um, the needs of our next generation, especially from the perspective of a student. Um, you know, students want in-person courses, they want online courses, they want hybrid courses, you know, a mix of both. And so how are we adapting and changing? But also from a workplace perspective, you know, our pivot to even consider remote work, that is a 
very clear trend that everyone's mm -hmm. pretty excited about. And we've learned through the pandemic that there are some jobs that you can do remotely. And so how are we, and we are currently here at St. Cloud State University piloting, you know, those efforts within our own uh, IT department. Um, and even like the creation of esports, like that's totally a thing, folks. You can go to school and, and you know, esports is gaming, right? So those different opportunities that we as a leader in higher education can adapt to make sure that we're paying attention um, to that. And I also think that goes into just that psychological safety for not only employees, but students, right? Like, can I come here? Can I grow? Can I learn? Um, and can I be safe in that space? And so how are we creating that inclusive and welcoming opportunities for for especially this next generation. That's fascinating you brought up the esports. E I think I was at Central Lakes College getting a tour and they actually have an esports like department where like a team. We right? do it's too. Just, yes. It's so interesting. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, I want to get I want to be part of that. I'll probably lose, but I still want to participate. Um So you know, one thing I hear a lot about Gen Z is this idea of a, of a, a renewed or a new focus on, on mental health and wellness. And I think this kind of relates to what Nancy said in that, you know, I think this is something that everybody kind of kind of desires. Chocoletta, how has the culture of, of universities and colleges changed in that way with regard to uh, mental health and wellness? And, and then, like, what do you think organizations can learn from that? Uh, from what you've learned? Absolutely, good question. Um, we, of course, have had, I think even before the pandemic, mental health has always been a component. As you know, most campuses, they have resources on campus, counselors, um, especially in the line of work that I do with discrimination and harassment, that is always a resource and something that we're encouraging students to utilize. Um, but I think just again, with the pandemic and the, I think, widening of eyes that we have some severe issues when it comes to mental health, even what that means. What, did it, what does it mean to be mentally healthy? Um, and how do you get that support you need? And so we, um, of course, on our campus, we have a department, but we also have others who are trained um, to, again, listen to those conversations, identify if there's some suicidal ideation pieces. Um, and our students come with so much, like coming to a campus, especially those, we have a very diverse, culturally diverse campus. And so, you know, coming from um, across the sea, right, <laughs> from a whole different country to a space of Minnesota where we have lots of nice snow and just that adjustment and just being away from family, especially our domestic students, they experience that same thing. And so we really uh, center our work um, and I, I shouldn't talk about, but we have a lot of things that we do here, especially as it relates to our It's Time initiative and strategies that really pay attention to the needs of our students because those needs are different. Um, especially if you're thinking about mental health, if you're thinking about even that perspective from just a people of color situation. Um, and so we just really um, believe that if we're not paying attention to those pieces from a student perspective in employee, we have lots of resources on campus from an employee perspective as well. So that workforce, I think, uh, piece again, as we're talking about the demographics and how we really um, educate um, mm -hmm. our upcoming generation and support them in those efforts of what that means. I think it's going to be very significant if we want folks to come to our organizations and stay and feel, again, safe. I think it's going to be huge. I think I saw, I can't remember what uh, organization put it out, but it was a study regarding like uh, what age, what age brackets or demographics are actually utilizing these, these wellness and mental health services within organizations. And it is the younger generations, right? But it's also the, the biggest uh, utilizers of these programs are the older generations too, which again, I think goes back to Nancy's point. Um, Nancy, like I think one thing that I almost assume jobs are gonna provide is that idea of an employee assistance program, right? It almost seems like it's just something you kind of have to do as an organization. Um, do you remember the point when those like that wasn't just a given where kind of like organizations had crossed over that threshold where it was just something that at a bare minimum you have to offer your employees? You know, I think, um, uh, do I remember? Are you suggesting that I'm old? Do I remember? <laughs> um, I don't I don't know that there was a moment in time where I started seeing more of that, but I do think that. Um, 
it, it, it's like everything else, right? It becomes part of the cultural, the expectations that people have become part of the cultural conversation and suddenly there's a movement. Um, and I also, um, you know, really wonder if the, the programs we put in place, the, the, you know, affinity groups, you know, if, if they are for the people, um, you know, employee assistance programs, mm -hmm. what have you, if they're for the people or if they're for the organization. And, you know, I, I always try to encourage um, folks to really center, you know, the workforce in developing, um, you know, anything, uh, because that's not something that organizations are used to. Um, they're used to thinking about sort of the needs of the mothership, which I think is really important, but those are entrenched in old school capitalist thinking, right? And, and we have to shift how we're thinking in order to make room for the diversity of thought and perspective and big ideas and abilities and cultures that we need to invite through our doors um, to really deliver the best work product. So that's, I mean, that reminds me of a lot of conversation I've had about HR. You know, HR used to be this big compliance animal, right? That's all they were in charge. All they did was try to keep the organization out of lawsuits, right? But now they're the, at the forefront of culture, culture change and DEI and all this really great stuff. And, you know, how do we get that transitional mindset into more of an operational point of view or, or into the operations of our organizations? Throw that out to the group. Because it just always bothered me. Like, why are some of these cultural ideas isolated in, in HR and not being really implemented, utilized, and uh, cheer led by operations and so forth? Well, I don't know that they always are. I don't, I don't actually know that HR, you know, first of all, I think when you're talking big cultural shifts or ideals, they cannot exist on an island. It's it's like DEI. So many organizations, you know, they subscribe to the idea of DEI because, well, right now they have to, and then they put it on an island and they wonder why it's not working. Um, I think the yeah. same can be said for sort of how you're talking about HR. I think we imagine that HR should be responsible for culture and a lot of HR departments talk a good game, but I think, um, you know, the organization, it has to start with leadership and it has to be a constant drumbeat and it has to, and, and I think there's gotta be, you know, a, a layer of any organization that sets the tone. Um, but for HR to own culture is silly. We all own culture. You know, we all own culture. We all are a part of how it feels to exist um, and commit to an organization. And if we don't see ourselves as being empowered and having some amount of accountability for the health of the culture that we operate in, then we're doing it wrong. And we won't be able to attract talent because what do people come to places for? Yes, your values, but also because I want to work with you because something about you resonates with me. And when I walk through the door, if you fed me a bag of goods and I have to sit next to somebody who's toxic, who doesn't recognize their role in the culture, I'm out. I don't leave because of organizations, right? I leave because of bad bosses. I yeah. leave because of unhealthy or toxic environments. So HR alone cannot manage culture. I appreciate what Nancy just said, because we do get into these silos as just one person is responsible for one thing. But what I tell employees and students all the time, that our culture is an impact of you and I and our interactions and our conversations and how we treat people here. And I really think if our purpose, especially I feel like it is here on this campus, is about caring for the entire human being and all of those identities and intersectionalities thereof, and not just the worker that we hired or the job that they perform. Um, if it's truly about people, then we we can show that and it could be seen and also felt by the folks who do come to work for our organizations. Yeah, culture always is, right? I think that's something that Deed uh, did specifically was take my role out of HR and say, this is, a, we need this um, and we need it out of the commissioner's office. It's like, it, it's a bun it's that important we're doing this. And one thing I always say to everyone and anyone who is on this call from Deed has probably heard this, um, is if I am doing this job alone, then I will fail. 
because it is the job of everyone. And that is absolutely true with the way that we are approaching DEI work as well. And, and um, Chuck Letta mentioned earlier, psychological safety. There's some really interesting research about meeting your goals better if your organization has psychological safety, right? And I uh, encourage you to read uh, some of that. And we're kind of uh, have been on a, a like 18 month journey with our managers and supervisors to say, what is psychological safety? How do you measure it in your teams? How do you talk about it? And then how do you, what tactical ways can you move forward if you get a score that's low here or there? And so, um, so th those are all things that are person centric, but when you are person centric, you will meet your goals better, right? Mm -hmm. So, so it's not one or the other. It's saying that uh, if if I have a culture that I believe in and I can be a part of it, um, and, and feel like I make that difference and feel welcome at work and that psychological safety to be myself, my whole self, and and share my ideas. Yeah, you might have to start with anonymous feedback. But you hope you get to a place where you can share that and it's not anonymous, but it's a work in progress. It takes t a long time and you have to have somebody who, it's, it's not tacked on to HR, somebody whose role it is to take on this work and to, um, and to continue it. It has to be intentional, right? Very intentional, yeah. So, you know, it's psychological safety seems like a no brainer. Just like you said, there's so much evidence and studies out there showing just how it positively impacts an organization in so many ways. Uh, why is this, and maybe I'm wrong here, but why does this seem to be a, a, a topic now and not, you know, quote unquote before? Well, I think that, you know, I don't know, Amy Edmonds, Edmondson is uh, an Harvard researcher and professor who kind of fell upon this, like mm -hmm. in, in her research, she, she was looking for something else and, and found uh, found what then became psychological safety in her research there. I don't know when she started that. I don't know the year, but I think that that to me was the point where she said, hey, I'm on to something here. What is this about teams that, uh, that, that, that we're looking at? And then coined the phrase psychological safety. I think she coined it. Um, and so I think that her research really brought it to the forefront. She did a TED talk, and I think that's what really like catapulted it, and it kind of went viral. But uh, but her um, her ongoing research then has really dug in and shown what a difference it can make at organizations. So so uh, I think maybe before we called it trust, right? Mm -hmm. Trust and psychological yeah. safety are different. They are different. Uh, trust is a component, but it, it's more than that. So I think that we talked about it differently. I don't love the term psychological safety. I, I like plain language. At yeah. DEED, I often call it building strong teams because it's a lot less academic. And if I say to anyone, do you want to build a strong team? You can go, yeah. But if I say like, do you want psychological safety? Somebody might say yes. And somebody might say what? Yeah. Right. So, so how can Anna, don't judge me. I'm from academia. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love that you brought it up. Thank you for bringing it up. It's really important. But but like, you know, for all of my, uh, you know, mm -hmm. constituents, which are the deed employees, I want them to know what I'm talking about without uh, without a lesson first. Right. Mm -hmm. So so I can hook them with building strong teams and then say, here's how we do it. It's tools based on this research. And I really love what Anna and Nancy said about this upcoming generation and how they're just pushing, right? They're pushing the curve, they're pushing the boundaries, and I really think they require it. I don't think it's no longer an option for this this generation that's coming because we all know they'll cancel you real quick if <laughs> or leave, in other words, yes. your your place of business or institution. Um, but I think mental health is just no longer you know, I think at some point in history, we just consider it a thing, right? Something you just have to do. There's things around it that you have to do. But I think it's it's more it's more for this newer generation because it's real, it's identifiable, and they know what they need, I think, more so than maybe other generations, even millennials, to make sure that they do have some mental health um, in that workplace life balance, right? Like all the things that come with um, just kind of knowing what you what you need and what you want from even an organization. I'm gonna Chuck Aletta. Slightly... Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Sean, please. I was going to say, I'm assuming you're slightly more pragmatic. I think it's not based on a necessity. I mean, back in the day during the Great Recession, when you had 11 job seekers for every available job out there, you could have an exceptionally high turnover rate. You could burn through employees. You could have people leave and stuff like that, and you could easily replace them. 
Now you can't. Now if your employee leaves, it could be months or you could get no applications for that open position for quite a long time, if ever. So because of that, you know, things like that we're discussing here um, become much, much more important and having a lower, uh, you know, having a good retention rate becomes absolutely vital to surviving this. Absolutely. I just want to just uh, uh, piggyback one thing. Um, when we talk about psychological safety, one of the things that I try to remind folks of all the time is the key to a healthy culture is uh, abandoning judgment. Um, mm. and, I, and I think when we think about individual responsibility for culture, we forget how simple it can be to just drop our expectations of other people, that they walk through the door making us comfortable. When we can really convince a workforce to just let go of some of the pettiness that we were all raised with, let's be honest, um, and just open our hearts and minds to big ideas and contributions of people that maybe aren't like us, when we do that, we are contributing to healthy culture and building stronger teams. So, oh, Anna, you're going to say something? Nancy, I would add to that. It's building stronger teams and, and, a, and a deeper culture, but it's also better ideas on how to get the work done, right? If we listen to all of the vast variety of many voices that come without that judgment, we start to hear different things and we start to hear good ideas in a different kind of way it, than, than if we're bringing that judgment that, that, that as you say, we're, we all have and we all were raised with. So if we can start to drop that, not only is the culture better, but the businesses are, but the business processes are better and the way we serve our customers ends up being better as well. And one additional piggyback, because I just love how Nancy said it, is if we were able to drop the pettiness, right, and the biases that come with who we are, um, and, and a step, one step further is even if you can't automatically make them go away, because we, we know through research that we all have them when we come with them from our experiences, but at least if you can check them. Um, I tell students all the time, let's check them at the door. What are my biases, right? What are the issues that I come with just because? And there are some that we know and we don't know, but how can we move forward knowing what those things are and just acknowledging what that looks like for us? I love that, Nancy. Thank you for that. We're petty. We're all petty. <laughs> we just have to know it, though, right? Just recognize it so it doesn't get in the way of us making good decisions. You know, I see a great question in the chat here from Catrice O'Neill. Hi, Catrice. Um, Catrice says, how are middle, uh, that bureaucracy is a perpetual barrier, and how are middle managers being empowered to lead your organization? And I love this question because I feel like middle managers have all the power. And also, you have to balance that like superpower. They have, they like, in the end, the leadership can do a lot, really. But like, your specific team is your team culture. It's your experience every day. So the middle managers really have all the power there to make that team great and to make that everyday experience great. But we have to balance that with accountability, right? Because we also know that there's some middle managers at any organization who aren't great. So how do we balance like the power that they hold with the accountability factors? And I think OKRs play into that as well. Is like, how are we tracking whether um, managers have the support they need to do great for their teams, right? To further empower them, but also to uh, to raise them up if they're, if they're, if they're not um, making a great team culture. So good question, thanks. I can't believe we're out of time. This is really too bad. We're having, we'll have to have a conference next time. Um, before I turn it over to Jessica O'Brien to talk about next month's Workforce Wednesday, I want to give each of you about 30 seconds to just give one last piece of advice or something that's off the top of your mind um, that you can share with our with our audience. So Chocoletta, uh, number one, again, thank you so much for, for joining us. Can uh, you share one piece of advice or information for our, our crew here? You can't give an academic 30 seconds to do that, but um, I can. One is um, if I could be a resource to anyone, especially again, I do come from the space of higher education. I do consider us leaders in the space, especially because we are preparing your workforce for tomorrow. So um, again, please don't hesitate to contact me if I could be a support or a partner. Thank you. Anna, I can't wait to continue to ride on your coattails for as long as I can. What is one piece of advice or recommendation you have for our um, our audience? 
difficult. One is hard, but I have two and they're short. Okay. Um, so for a decade, I worked for the Step Up Youth Employment Program. So I worked with uh, teenagers all the time. And I would say if you are, um, if you ever need a do giant dose of hope, go hang out with some teenagers because the future is extremely yep. bright. When we're talking about this generation, boy, I can't wait to work with more of them, right? And I said the same thing about millennials and anyone and anyone behind me, I'm, I'm Gen X as well. So I'd also say that as we talk about this, Gen X, who are often leaders in organizations now, are like, boy, this is great news for Gen X. We are flexible and we are adaptable and we are ready. We are open to that kind of change. So as leaders, we are we will navigate welcoming Gen Z into the workplace well if we allow for it, right? So throwing those judgments aside and, and being the adaptable generation is going to bode well for us all working together. I, I can't wait to hand the keys over. I'm ready to do it now. I think Gen Z, that generation, they, I mean, just from my own experience with, with family members and friends, it's there's a lot of good hearts there. And I'm really excited to see what they can do. Um, Sean, thank you, my friend, for joining us. And uh, one piece of advice, 30 seconds. Sure, I guess my one piece of advice is that with the way things are in hiring in the labor force right now, you're not going to be able to grow your way out of this current situation. What you've got to be able to do is yeah. you've got to be able to articulate, you know, what you're about, what you stand for, and be able to articulate why you would want to work, you know, why would someone want to work for you? And you've got to be able to articulate that effectively. And you've got to be able to articulate that also to your current employees as well and keep that going strong because this is the labor force issues that we're seeing right now are going to be something that's going to exist for the next 10 years. And it's our current reality and we've got to adapt effectively. Thanks, John. Um, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad I get to continue to learn from you and that you just haven't turned your back on, on Deed 100% just yet. Um, Nancy. Again, I'm so honored to have you. I'm going to throw a little link in here, the chat, to, uh, to Nancy's book, Work Like a Boss. Um, amazing piece of literature, exciting piece of literature. Nancy, again, thank you. It's an honor to have you here. What is uh, one piece of advice or a recommendation you have for our audience? Well, there's a question in the chat just about what I said about what's the one thing that a healthy culture needs and it's lack of judgment. So I guess for me, um, the advice that I give is always impress upon the workforce their role in shifting culture and making things better. It's not just about leadership dictating something. It's not about us abdicating responsibility to leadership. It's about recognizing that when you join an organization, you are part of how it will grow and evolve. You have a role in that and you have power. Um, I also think, uh, you know, one of the biggest issues that most organizations are grappling with is the change required to get to this place where we are open to the next generation. And I think it's important for organizations to remember that if you want the change to happen, if you want your organization to change, you have to be able to invite people to something better. So you need to be able to articulate it exactly what it is you are trying to do and where you're trying to go and why. Because if you can't compel them, they are not going to follow you. They'll find somebody who will. That's exciting and inspiring. It's an invitation to really celebrate who you are, right? And that authenticity and get excited about that. Hopefully people see it that way. Um, I would like to pass the mic over to Jessica O'Brien. Jessica, you want to give us a little introduction or uh, perspective on what's happening? Yeah, so I love I I loved all of the um, the whole perspective of this whole panel, and I really appreciate this last note about inviting people to something better. And so I am um, very excited to invite you all to our next um, Workforce Wednesday webinar on April fifth where we are going to be talking about cultivating a supportive workplace culture for youth. Um, and so um, in that same frame of inviting people to something better and meaningful, um, we are going to hear from a panel um, who are going to share about innovative approaches, practices, and programs that are engaging and supporting youth in meaningful ways. And so I am super excited about it, and we hope that you join us for um, kind of a deeper discussion uh, continuing from today. So uh, back to you, James. Thank you very much. I just lost power. I hope that didn't uh, impact what everybody was seeing. 
Um, but it seems like I'm back now. So thanks so much again to the panelists, Nancy, Sean, Chocoletta, and Anna. This was an amazing conversation. We could have kept it going. Um, for the audience, please stick around. We're going to start the unplug session here shortly. Um, and with that, I would like to go ahead and just hand it over to Della Ludwig, our uh, comrade in arms in the central region of Minnesota. <laughs> Uh, Della is going to help facilitate our unplug session. So thanks, Della. Great. Thank you. Thanks, James. Wow, that was really, really cool. Excellent panel discussion. Obviously, again, ran out of time. Um, we had over 500 people register for this um, presentation and panel discussion. So that just tells you what a hot topic this is.